So I'm going to speak about improving subnational resilience against global economic shocks. And as you would expect, a lot of the conversation would be around the macro, around the global economy, around the Nigerian economy, and around the threats that subnationals face and have to deal with. So we go to, I will go through the global picture, what I call Nigeria's curse, the state's problems, and some recommendations and perspectives. So if we go to the first slide, where we start talking about the global picture. In a few short months since the beginning of this year, we've seen how the outlook for the global economy has deteriorated sharply. Hopes for a quick resolution of the Ukraine war have disappeared, resulting in a cost of living crisis, high inflation, and as you know, in Great Britain, you already have one big casualty in the Chancellor having had to resign as a result of these crises. Compared to earlier this year, you can see that over a third of the countries in the world weighted by GDP are expected to be in contraction in 2022. In January, it was only 5% of world GDP affected. Now you're talking about countries accounting for 35% of world GDP on a weighted basis going to be in contraction in 2022. That gives, that gives you an idea of the world we are moving into. Now there's an interesting thing about the transparency emerging markets. And I think it's important to look at this particular um, slide. The red dot, which we're looking at now, deviation from pre-pandemic pre output trends. The red dot tells us where in January the forecast was for different um, regions of the world. And the bars tell us where we are today in terms of the latest world economic outlook. And what you find interesting here is that if you look at the emerging market developing economies of Asia, the red dot is right inside the bar, which means that the outlook today is much worse than it was in January. The same thing with um, EMDs in general, same thing with developing economies in Europe, same thing with China, but uh, same thing with Latin America, now Latin America and the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa, the red dot is right on the point of the, of the, of the bar, which means that between January and now, there has been no deterioration in the outlook for these countries compared to the rest of the world. Uh, you can see the United States where the outlook was actually... <laughs> was actually for a positive um, growth. And this is where it is now. Now look at the Middle East and Central Asia. And the outlook now is even better than it was in January. Now why, why is this important? Why is it important to look at Sub-Saharan Africa and then the Middle East and Central Asia? The reason is that the Middle East and Central Asia is looking very good because of high oil and energy prices. So the question is, if the Ukraine war, if the rising food and energy crisis, the rising food and gas prices, if they're good for Saudi Arabia, if they're good for Kuwait, if they're good for Qatar, if they're good for Iran, why are they bad for Nigeria? Okay, so uh, please don't let anybody tell you that your problem is, is because of the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war has led to rising oil prices, it's led to rising gas prices. It should be good news for Nigeria. It is good news for all oil producing countries. It is bad news for us. So the problem is Nigeria, not Ukraine. And we'll explain um, how 
that problem has built up or what, what we think is the cause of that problem on the fiscal and the monetary side. You've got gathering clouds. And there is a silent gathering cloud that people are not paying attention to. If you look at this graph, it is the strengthening US dollar. Over the last few weeks and months, the dollar has been rising at a rate that we only saw last in 1980. A number of factors, um, obviously, uh, with the sanctions on Russia, America is selling gas and energy to Europe. The dollar is becoming a safe haven uh, in times of global insecurity. Is that this revaluation, this increase in the value of the trade-weighted dollar by 17%, has placed a tremendous burden on currencies worldwide. You find this uh, in Ghana, you find this in South Africa, you find this in Europe. You find that in general, against all major currencies, the dollar has been rising. I want you to bear this graph in mind, especially this arrow that you have. I want you to bear this graph in mind, share this arrow that you have, because a few graphs down the line, we're going to come to the Nigerian foreign exchange market, and you'll see the parallels I'm trying to draw. Now, I have a section that is referred to as Nigeria's curse. We talk about oil as a blessing, or it can be a curse. What are our own problems? Let us begin with us being an oil economy with no oil revenue. In 2011, the federal government earned about $60 billion from the oil sector. This amount has been going down successively. Today, in 2022, Based on half-year figures, if we annualize, the revenue of the federal government from the oil sector is only $2.9 billion. From $60 billion to $2.9 billion. I know we have been told often that this was partly a result of declining oil prices a few years ago. What is the explanation today? What is the explanation today that with high oil prices, federal government revenue in 2022, when the oil markets are buoyant, it's only $2.9 billion. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to give numbers. I'm going to give tables. I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions. Okay? Um, I'm tired of being quoted, but uh, I'll give you the facts. And... The facts will speak to themselves. Now, what is the result? Budget. Everywhere we budget revenue, and everywhere we underperform. In 2015, we projected revenue of 3.5 trillion. We ended up with 3.2, which is close. 2016, 3.9, we had 2.9. 2017, 5.1, down to 2.7 in reality. 20 18, we projected 7.2 trillion and got 3.9. 2019, we projected 6.9 and got 4.1. 2020, we projected 5.8 and got 3.4. The gap keeps widening, and I think in this current budget that we have for this year, we are projecting 9 trillion naira. And most likely, we are going to underperform that figure. So what is the result of failing to raise this revenue? What is the result of the failure to trap revenues and the failure to fund the government? Now, the consequence of this gap is that it has to be filled if the spending is going to continue. And 
what did we do as a country? We went through what are unorthodox coping mechanisms that have placed greater difficulty on us. In the absence, turn to Central Bank for Ways and Means. Now, under the Central Bank of Nigeria Act, and this is something you all need to know, the Central Bank is not allowed to, is not allowed to, and when that happens, the Central Bank cannot lend more than 5% of the previous year's revenue as ways and means. So if you look at the numbers we're seeing in revenue over the last seven, eight years, we've never really crossed four trillion naira. Which means if we were complying with our law, the central bank today should not be lending the federal government more than 200 billion naira. Where are we today? 21 trillion. We are lending, the central bank has lent this government 100 times what the limit is. Now, I started complaining about this in 2016, when we were at 4.7 trillion. I remember I was at a conference organized by Savannah Center, which was owned by the current chief of staff to the president, President Gambari, and he was there. And I stated at that time, we were only at 4.7, that this is unhealthy. This will destroy the currency, it will create inflation. At that time, many of you remember the backlash. In fact, the next day there was a headline in the Punch newspaper, it said, Sanusi lied. 4.7, I was lying. We're on 21 trillion. And everything we see, and I will show the link between this, uh, these slides and what we are seeing. Now look at the rate at which waste and means has grown. 2017, 2018 started rising fast, 2019. From 2020, we start going quarterly. This is just, you know, when you have ways and means, you know what it means? Central bank is just printing money. That's what it is. Because the, the, the one thing about the central bank is that it is the only institution that has the power to create money ex nihilo, out of nothing, the way God created the world. You create money, you don't need to tax, you don't need to collect it, you just sit down, as you can, the central bank can just create two trillion naira and put in your account, and that is two trillion into the economy. Now, just to explain it in a simple manner, if you put in two trillion naira and your dollar reserves are not increasing, what then happens? Your naira is devalued. But the problem we have had is at the time we were expanding the balance sheet of the central bank, we were also saying that we want a strong currency. It's not possible. You can't eat your cake and have it. You cannot increase the supply of Naira relative to dollars, the supply of Naira relative to production, and expect prices and exchange rates to remain stable. And so there has been a fundamental lack of understanding of how economies work. And this is something that's been tried. You know, you've seen Idi Amin in Uganda, we've seen Mugabe in Zimbabwe, we have seen Chavez in uh, Venezuela. These policies have been tried again and again in different parts of the world and they have failed. And for the last seven years, we have continued pursuing these policies. And what is the result? These are your inflation rates. Next slide, please. We've had rising inflation, core inflation, food inflation. Simple arithmetic formula, when you get to inflation of 80, this is the only country I have seen where the statistics board announces 
Inflation is 18%. Inflation is 19%. And nothing is happening. You know, it's like somebody said it rained yesterday. An 18% rate of inflation means that the price of everything on average doubles every four years. That's a simple arithmetic. Divide 72 by the rate of inflation and you get the number of years it will take for the price of things to double. So if rice starts at 8,000, at 18% 18 inflation, after four years, it will be 16. After another four years, it will be 32. Second, the next slide, exchange it. Now, I told you to remember that slide on the strengthening dollar and that arrow. Look at the widening gap between the parallel market rate and the official rate of exchange. As the dollar has strengthened in the world, as all currencies have lost value against the dollar, we have stubbornly insisted that our own currency officially, officially will not be devalued. But the markets do not take orders. Markets work on demand and supply and market conditions. Today, the gap between the official rate and the parallel market rate is 300 Naira. You know, what this means is if you can get $100,000, $100,000 officially and round trip it, you make a profit of 30 million Naira. If you get a million dollars today in the official market and sell, you can make a profit of 300 million Naira. There is no country where you, you create this kind of opportunity for rent seeking. And you expect people not to take advantage of the rent? I know something, I can sell something for 700 and I can get it for 400 and I should not arbitrage. So, when I say that our problems are of our own making, they're of our own making. You, there's no way you can be selling your foreign exchange at below market and not expect arbitrage and not expect corruption. And that's why a small number of people can become multi-billionaires for doing nothing but arbitraging foreign exchange. It's the same thing that happened in the oil sector with the subsidies. That is happening in the foreign exchange market. Oh, you've moved on. Let me go. The next element is, what is the source of this lack of revenue? One source is what I call the subsidy free-for-all. You know, I can say this because I've been saying this is 2011, 2012, since I was governor of Central Bank. And I'll continue saying it. And to my friend Ashiwaju, if, if you win, and if you continue with this, I will continue saying it. So you have to be ready to deal with me. Because... Okay, so... Because... Um, no, I think you should know, because... If you continue, we will be fighting. You and I will be fighting. But so now look at this. I said I will give you numbers and you make up your mind. What I have here are liters per day per capita against GDP per capita of countries. And I'm using the official numbers. NMPC tells us officially that we are consuming 66 million liters a day. Stated using the parallel market rate and using the official rate. And we are consuming 0.3 liters per day per capita. We are consuming more than Indonesia, more than Egypt, more than Pakistan, more than Kenya, more than Cote d'Ivoire on a per capita basis. 
You can make up your mind. Why is it, are we drinking the petrol? But there's also something interesting. There's a spot in there, Nigeria 2019. And it's point two. In 2019, in 2019, officially, officially, we were importing 40 million liters a day. 2019. In 2022, officially, we are importing 66 million liters a day. In three years, we have increased our petrol consumption by 50%. Please tell me, is it the population? Is it the number of cars? I don't know. I'm not telling you what is happening, but just ask yourself if it makes sense that in three years, you increase by 50%. And then look at the numbers. Look at the trend. We have become an outlier. Another way to look at this is to compare liters per day per vehicle. And we got the vehicle numbers from MBS and from different um, nations data. In Nigeria, we're consuming almost six liters a day per vehicle. More than Iran. Iran, is, Iran has a much more intensive road network on a per capita basis. Iran has even more subsidies. Petrol in Iran today costs five cents. It is 15%, 15% of the cost of petrol in Nigeria. But we say, based on these numbers, so we say that we are consuming more per vehicle than Iran. You know, on these numbers, every vehicle in Nigeria goes 40 kilometers a day. Every vehicle does 40 kilometers, if these numbers are true. You know, some of these numbers, I don't know what we do as Nigerians. We don't even ask ourselves simple questions. If you tell me I'm importing 66 million, consuming 66 million liters of petrol a day, let's assume a fuel tanker does 23,000 liters? 23? 33,000? 33,000 liters? That means every single day we have 2,000 fuel tankers on our roads. Where are these tankers? Do you see them? 2,000 every day. And remember that some are going and some are coming back, okay? So every day we should see 4,000 fuel tankers on Nigerian roads, if we are indeed consuming 66 million liters a day. Like I said, I'm not telling you what my own reading is. I'm hoping that you will make your own reading. But again, as of 2019, we were doing four, less than four. And let me also say something. If you go back to 2015, not 2019, I clearly remember the Minister of State Petroleum, Emmanuel Kachuku, announcing that we are consuming 29 million liters a day, that that was the correct number, 29. So between 2015 and 2019, we have magically moved from 29 million liters a day to 66 million liters a day. And on some days, 100 million. Next slide. I have chosen one country to make a comparison. And again, like I said, I'm just giving you numbers. You'll decide when you have these numbers, you'll decide what you think is happening. I'm tired of translating. Nigeria has a population of 216 million. Pakistan, 214. Roughly the same, right? GDP per capita, 1 1,364 to 1,501. Roughly the same. Road network in thousands of kilometers, 195 to 263. Not too far, far off. 
Road network per 1 million inhabitants, 0 0.9 to 1.2. Now, one would expect that in this situation, our fuel consumption should be roughly equal to that of Pakistan, or even slightly less. But what do we have? We are told that we are importing two and a half times, about three times, 66 million liters, while Pakistan is importing only 21 million liters. Three times. A country, our size, our population, our per capita GDP, our road network, our number of cars, but we are importing three times. You can believe these numbers. I don't believe them, but I'm not saying you should not believe them. But, you, I mean, you can begin to see where the problem is. We continue. And we're looking at liters per capita daily consumption of PMS by state. We find that there are certain patterns. Some of the states that are on our western border with West Africa seem to be having more than other states, which indicates that a lot of smuggling is happening across the border. We are not really importing for Nigeria, but for other countries. And I would urge you to please begin to interrogate some of the publicly available numbers, like these numbers of trucks. I actually had two names that I had stated. I took them out because I don't want to call names. But if you go there, you will see an indigenous Nigerian oil marketer, one-man business, that according to these numbers, is lifting 129 trucks every day. More than total. More than total Nigeria. 129. And you know, this is how we have eroded our own economy. We have dug a deep hole in the pockets of the government and we have bankrupted the state. What is the problem that states are facing? Can we go to the next slide? First is you have dwindling support from the center. As a result of poor financial manage management, as a result of leakages in the federal government and the state-owned enterprises, very little is left from the st for the states. And I keep repeating, I don't need to, but I keep repeating, I hope you remember that I lost my job in the central bank for making this same point. It is not about a particular party. I have no party, my party is Nigeria. My party is Nigeria. So this is the problem we had going back 2014. Mr. Brown will continue having. Ashwaju knows my party is Nigeria. And yes. <laughs> okay. Now, look at fact distributions. They are falling by 60% and they are almost certain to fall again. We got to a point where NMPC was no longer remitting money to FAC, and in fact borrowing money from the central bank when oil price was high. You know, honestly, honestly that any institution can do this in any country and get away with it, I don't understand. And it has been going on for two decades. We're just not serious as a country. We're down to 4.6 FAC. Conceptually, why are states going to cry? Why are, why are states going to suffer? If you're a governor of a state, your costs are tracking the rate of inflation. Your costs are tracking the parallel market rate. But your revenues are tied to an official rate. So when the governor wants to buy something to run his state, he is buying something priced at black market rate. But when he's getting his revenue, the dollars that come to the national coffers, 
they are being sold at 430. How do you take, you know, for every $1 billion, for every $1 billion we sell at 400 Naira, when we can sell it at 600, 700 Naira, that is 200 billion that should come to the states that has gone into private pockets. It's a transfer, it's a transfer of public resources from public hands to private pockets. You know, Nigeria has always been, and it continues to be, a rentier state. The state does not exist for development. The state exists as a site of rent extraction to make those who control the state rich, to turn them into billionaires overnight. That is how the state has always operated. And in 2023, if you have an election, we cannot afford to continue with that trend. Because any continuation of, look at Mali, look at Burkina Faso, look at Guinea Conakry, look at what's happening with insecurity. If you think it will not happen in this country, you'll be shocked if you continue, you get to a point where you're in a Mali situation. We can't keep pushing the brink. We have to come back. Um, look at the support. According to the last set of data we have from 2017, only 50% of states generated enough recurrent revenue to cover their wages, overheads, and debt service. And given the fall in FAC, this number is likely to have increased. I think I didn't highlight a point in one of the earlier slides. Um, let me see which slide it was. I think it's important. I should have highlighted that point. Um, anyway. Um, okay. Sorry to bring you back, but can you go to slide nine, please? Where I had debts. Slide nine, the blue chart. Today, the cost of servicing debt in Nigeria with the federal government is 2.597 trillion. Whereas, Revenues were 2.4. This is first half of 2022. In other words, debt service is now 108% of revenue. Every, every Naira the federal government earns, every Naira the federal government earns goes to service debt. And it is not enough it has to borrow to service the debt and then begin to borrow to pay salary, borrow, borrow to build roads, borrow to build. Let me ask you, what do you think we are leaving our children behind? A mountain of debt. Every generation wants to leave a legacy so that our children and grandchildren will be praying for us and asking God to have mercy on us, not cursing us. You leave them with a mountain of debt. You have not educated them. Money that should go, money that we should put into their education, into their health care, even assuming this fuel subsidy is all genuine, we have taken that money to give ourselves cheap petrol. That is what we are borrowing to enjoy cheap petrol today so that our children will pay that debt. When we have not invested the money in the education and prepared them to earn and service the debt. And even though we recognize there is a problem, what are we saying? 
We will continue paying until June. No plans. We have no plans for changing. Yeah, we see, the, we see the problem, but we are going to continue. I'm sorry for the next president who comes in on June and says I'm removing subsidy on day one. I'm sorry for I'm, 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 I don't know what kind of political stability you're going to have. We have not even started. We have not even started retracing our steps. Closing this gap in exchange rates, closing the gap in these uh, inflated subsidies, reducing the subsidy payments, we're going to pile up. While we are spending 108% of our revenue on debt service, how are we, what, I mean, what, can, look, countries cry when they're spending 30% of their revenue on debt service. Today, the Caribbean, they're crying. 30, 35%, they're crying. We are spending 100%. We're all laughing. We're having parties. If we don't fix this, we're going to have our children curse us to eternity. So, what do we do with the states? First is to recognize that NMPC... It's not a cash cow, it's a money pit. Just unbundle it, disband it, continue to implement the PIB properly, and turn them into a properly commercial. And when I say implement, it is not just to set up companies and leave the same people and the same processes and the same system, but with a different name means properly implement that act. And then let them pay royalty and taxes. We need to su have successful TSA implementation. And here, Kaduna has shown leadership. This is research by budget. It says Kaduna is the only state to have met the World Bank state fiscal transparency, accountability, and sensitivity scoring criteria for two years in a row. And this includes running a functional TSA that covers more than 80% of revenues. But more generally, I think states need to free themselves of federal dominance. You have to free yourselves of, dominate, of relying on the federal government. Just assume, just assume that you're not going to get help from the center, okay? Build your infrastructure. As the Kaduna State Governor said, build your own power supply. Attract your own investors. Educate your children. Create your own jobs. And we're hoping that investors will continue looking below the radar. I gave the example of Lagos and how well it's done. Kaduna is following that path. The state governments need to continue competing so that people look beyond the macro and know that below the radar there are subnationals that are doing the right thing. And we have to tell that story. As vice chair of Kadipa, I'm proud to be associated with Kadipa. And I'm proud to speak about Kaduna anywhere I go. Because even as a Nigerian, I do not want to bring anybody who will be embarrassed. If I see somebody who says he's thinking of something, I say, come to Kaduna. Or come to Lagos. You go somewhere where you have a story that you're not going to regret. And I think every state needs to start taking that up, and that is the only way we're going to give development to the people. We can no longer rely on the center. So... I said I would give you numbers. I would let you draw your own conclusions. I have mine. I have been saying them before, but I'm not going to repeat them now. Um, but we can see where from the fiscal side and the monetary side, the challenges that we have, and the decisions that will be taken to correct are going to be very painful decisions. So let me first of all, please request our politicians. You must prepare the minds of Nigerians for difficult decisions. Anybody who tells you 
that it is going to be easy. Please don't vote for him. Because it's either he's lying to you or he does not know what job he's going to get. You cannot, you cannot with this level of debt, this level of debt service, with this level of collapse in revenue, with this level of poverty, you cannot. And you have to take corrective decisions. Tariffs on electric sector have, have, to, be, have to be corrected. Tariffs in the oil sector have to be corrected. Before we correct that, we have to deal with the opportunities for rent seeking. You have to close off the inflated numbers, the false numbers. And I hope that whoever becomes president in 2023, the first thing they should do is ask NMPC to document and bring evidence for every dollar they took as subsidy. They must give the, they must give the ships that came, and we can verify from insurance companies there must, be, there must be proof before you pay subsidy, there must be proof that you brought it in at the price you said you brought it in. Because until we bring credibility and transparency to the management of public finance, no government has the moral right to impose hardship on Nigerians. They have suffered enough. But if we deal with the rent seeking, if we close the gaps, then we can ask Nigerians to make the sacrifice, and they have to make sacrifice. And we, are, we have made sacrifices, but we have to make a sacrifice to reset this country. So please, there is no rosy picture. It's going to be difficult. Uh, those who want to contest elections, I wish you all the best. Um, but I hope uh, you prepare your minds that it's not going to be an, it will not be a popular job. Populism destroys a nation. You have to take decisions that are unpopular. If every time you take an election, a decision is about whether I will win the next election, you will never do the right thing. So we have to take difficult decisions and try to explain to Nigerians as much as possible, but these decisions are absolutely necessary if this country is going to survive. <laughs>